Welcome and good morning to this, the fourth meeting of the Equal Opportunities Committee in 2016. Um, can I make the usual request that if you're going to use electronic devices that you have them uh, on silent um, so they don't interfere with committee proceedings today. Um, agenda item one is uh, to take agenda item three in private. Are committee members content to do this? Yeah, excellent, thank you very much. Agenda item two is us moving on to the uh, proposals and ideas for our work programme. And as you can see, we have a very large round table uh, today. Um, we've done this before, so we, we managed it quite well the last time. So um, a few sort of a house rules. If you want to come in, catch my eye, I'll put you on a wee list and I'll try and group things where people have maybe got uh, conversations going on so that we can make it a bit more free flowing. And the same for, for committee members, if you want to come in to ask a question, please please just do the same. And we'll try and coordinate things through me and, and get as, as good a flow as, of conversation as we, we possibly can. But can I thank you all for coming along this morning, for contributing uh, to the committee this morning, but also for some of the written evidence that you've already given us, we really value um, your thoughts and your feelings about the committee's work programme and where we should go from here. We've got a lot of opportunities to really investigate and expand and, and, and do good things with the work we're doing, but we can only do that with your help, so we're really grateful for that. Um, well, I want to <laughs> uh, go around the table, really, so that we can just all in introduce ourselves um, in the normal fashion. So I'm Christina McKelvey, I'm the convener of the committee. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Chris, I'm the Head of Policy and Communications at the Scottish Refugee Council. Good morning everyone, my name is Alex Cole-Hamilton, I'm the Vice Convener of the Committee. Hello, I'm Derek Young, I'm a Senior Policy Officer with Age Scotland, the national charity representing older people and promoting their rights and interests. Good morning, my name is Jamie O'Neill, I'm the Projects Manager at Roshney, which is based in Glasgow. Hello, I'm Janice MacDonald, the Chief Officer with the Scottish Council on Deafness, a membership-based organisation um, encompassing all sorts of communication issues. Jamie Shmkoviak from One in Five, a campaign to increase political participation and representation of disabled people. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Jeremy Balfa. I'm an MSP for the Lovians. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Lancashire. I'm a director for Remploy Scotland and we support disabled people into sustained work. Uh, hello, I'm Tim Hopkins from the Equality Network, which is a national lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex organisation in Scotland. Hi, I'm Annie Wales. I am the MSP for Glasgow. Good morning. I'm Danny Boyle. I'm the Parliamentary and Policy Officer for Race Equality Intermediary Bemis. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. I'm Carol Yurt from the Jimmy Reid Foundation, an independent think tank that embraces all politics. I'm Emma Rich. I'm the Director of Engender, which works in Scotland on women's social, economic and political equality. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Fee and I'm an MSP for West Scotland. Good morning. My name is Suki Wan. I'm the Member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Glasgow Shettleston. We're the democratically elected voice of young people across Scotland. Good morning. I'm Megan Crawford. I'm Chair of the Scottish Secular Society and we advocate for the separation of religion from the state. Good morning, David Torrance, MSP, Kirkcaldy constituency. Good morning, my name is Ian Burke, I'm a solicitor, but I'm here as convener of the Law Society's Equality and Diversity Committee. So as you see, a lot of interest and, and interested people around the table to hear from, and we're very, very keen to hear from you. But before I kick off with a, a first question, we had an informal breakfast this morning with some of your service users, and you, you, you were very, very kindly brought some of the service users along, and we managed to hear uh, some of their concerns and their ideas this morning. And can I say we're really, really grateful for everyone who took part in that this morning. Sometimes in an informal setting, we get to hear the real stuff, um, but hopefully you'll feel confident enough after having the informal breakfast and a chance to meet us that you'll be able to talk about the real stuff on the record too because it will be really helpful. So really I think it, my opening question would be um, we've obviously got some new powers come into the Scottish Parliament. We're, we're looking to expand and uh, um, you know, investigate how we can use those to the best of our ability to ensure that we inform policy and, and make lives better for people because that's what we want to do. Um, we all know that fairness doesn't actually sometimes mean equality. And if we can get the two things right, it makes a difference to, to people's lives. So really um, what we want to do is hear from you. We're all in listening mode this morning. And, and that's essentially my opening question you know, what, what, what is the big issue for you and, and how do you think we can resolve it? Ah, Carol. 
Johnny Reid Foundation is very keen that the committee uses the full range of its powers on human rights um, to ensure that the public sector in Scotland complies with the Human Rights Act, its duties under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act. And given that we know that there are at least 10,000 public bodies in Scotland, um, that could have very quickly a huge impact if um, human rights were mainstreamed across staff training in terms of service design and delivery, informing decisions about funding. And also, crucially, um, the power of the public pound is used to reward private sector companies through the procurement process um, if they comply with human rights. Um, so that would mean that companies that blacklist, who have been proven to be blacklisting, would not be rewarded with multi-billion or multi-million or multi-billion pound contracts. Um, that companies that pay decent wages and ensure the human rights to an adequate standard of living are rewarded through public contracts. So there's a lot of powers that the, the committee can use, um, and we would urge the committee to do so. One of the things that we, we have, there's an emerging theme, is the UN concluding observations on what international obligations and how we can maybe use some of that as a roadmap. And that came through very, very clearly with the evidence that we took at the last round table. I wonder if anybody's got any thoughts on how we can use that, Alex? Well, I was just saying, Thank you, convener. I should declare an interest as well in that I, I'm an, a former convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights, also known as Together. Um, I'd like to ask Carol just um, to expand on her point about the use of the new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, but also um, in respect of, you mentioned in, uh, in particular blacklisting in building firms as an example of denial of human rights. Um, is there anything other than the concluding observations, is there an audit um, of where we are failing in our obligations to various human rights treaties, particularly across public bodies? Um, I think these are global challenges about ensuring that the public sector fulfil their human rights obligations. Um, and in fact, uh, just last month, the, the UN had a day of general discussion around how the public sector um, can do more to deliver on human rights obligations. So, I mean, these are their common themes. Um, you talked about the concluding observations. I mean, that sets out a very realistic roadmap about what the public sector in Scotland can do. But there's also a universal periodic review, and 132 recommendations were made in respect of the UK in 2012. Um, and there's very little evidence that they are explicitly talked about in health boards, local authorities, housing associations. And it's not to say that they're not complying, but we do need to have the language of human rights used. And we do need to have um, even just little things like acknowledging that human rights matter in housing, in health, in social work, in children's rights. Um, and there's also the issue about people asserting their rights because the UN, through concluding observations, have identified that people have a real difficulty in enforcing their rights in relation to the public service. Uh, and you don't have rights until you know about them. So people don't really know about their human rights. You know, you can go onto a local authority website and you see a button about freedom of information, about data protection, but you don't necessarily see a section around human rights. Um, so there's all sorts of little things that can be done in staff training. Um, there's all sorts of recommendations around staff training. The UN have got lots of packs of information and training kits that can be used. So we're not short of concluding observations or universal periodic review. And of course, there's also the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, the UK coalition government in 2013 published um, the first national action plan on business and human rights for the UK. That would deal with things like procurement um, so that you reward companies that comply with human rights. Um, the UK government updated that in May 2016, which was very welcome. Um, in Scotland, we could actually deliver that UK action plan, but what we've decided to do is do our own, and that's not yet published. So another issue for the committee could perhaps be to take up when the Scottish National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is going to be developed, who participates in that, how transparent the process is. Um, so that there's all, all sorts of ways that we can influence the public sector and the private sector in respect of human rights. Alex, do you want to come back? No, I, just to say thank you for that. And, and from your reflection then, the, um, the discussions we've had as a committee to almost use the concluding observations of the various UN reports um, would be a good roadmap for this committee in terms of what we need to fix. Yes, but the, the UN has actually produced guidance and it says it's, you haven't, it's not just the concluding observations to look at. Um, you look at, for, exam, for example, the Special Rapporteur in Housing, and she visited Scotland. It was covered in the Daily Record when she produced a report, so you need to look at what 
what the, the Special Rapporteur on, on that has done, look at the UPR, look at the UN Guiding Principles in Business and Human Rights, and you need to hoover them all up. Um, because the danger of treating them in isolation is that you elevate some human rights over others. And they are all interdependent. There is no hierarchy. And we will collectively benefit if each other's human rights are respected. Emma. Um, thanks very much, Convener. Um, if I could pick up on a point made by um, Jatin Haria from CRER at the last session. Um, Engender was one of the signatories to a letter expressing some concerns around the expansion of the remit of this committee to incorporate human rights. Um, which was principally predicated on the question of capacity um, and the concerns that, um, in fact, some UN committees had already expressed about the way that some protected characteristics were vanishing into a broad equalities agenda and the capacity challenges of sustaining focus on all of the important work that we're doing. Um, we were also hopeful that the Scottish Parliament could consider some of the international models of how parliaments can engage with the question of human rights. Um, and there are a variety of approaches that different uh, parliaments have taken. Um, but having said all of that, Engender is very enthusiastic about human rights. Uh, we have for over a decade been using international obligations and participating in UN processes in order to advance and promote women's human rights. Um, and I think the concluding observations do raise both a challenge uh, for this committee and for the Scottish Parliament, and as well as a possibility. And one of the key challenges we would see, and I agree with everything thing Carol has said um, about not only using concluding observations, but one of the challenges is there are currently 900 outstanding concluding observations that have been um, put to the UK government, uh, many of which have not been written with devolution context in mind. Um, as a Scottish NGO, we have struggled uh, in engaging with UN committees in what are very abbreviated and hasty processes to fully explain and ex explicate the devolution context and to set out what is reserved questions and what are devolved questions. Um, and those challenges, I think, are very strongly reflected in what comes down in the concluding observations. So I suppose the challenge for the committee will be to how to unpick what is intended um, for Scotland and perhaps what is not intended. And an example of this is um, that in its recent set of concluding observations, CEDAW, the Women's Rights Committee, said we should have a UK-wide strategy on violence against women. Now, the convener and others will know that, in fact, because powers to address violence against women are entirely devolved, except for questions of immigration and asylum to Scotland, that that is a very impractical and um, potentially unwelcome suggestion for the violence against women and women's sector. So there is a need to, I think, tease out what is meant and intended. Um, but I do think there are possibilities for using those, um, and I'm particularly minded of something which Alistair Pringle said in the same session uh, about concerns around the public sector equality duty, its efficacy in driving substantive change within the public sector, which is a concern that the CEDAW committee itself identified. So there are undoubtedly overlaps and interleavings between our human rights concerns and equalities concerns, and the concluding OBS, I think, present a, a real opportunity. But I would um, urge the committee to be mindful of the challenge of, of, of processing 900 outstanding concerns and potentially contemplating the interrelationship between those and the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights, which many, if not most, of the organisations around this table will have heftily been involved with. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, I, obviously, Emma, you know, I, I agree with you. We've had, we have had this conversation on a, a few occasions as well. I think if, for this committee, what we're trying to tease out right now is where... where, where you know, where can we find a route of, of something that would be meaningful for us, us to do? Um, and that's one of the emerging themes. I, I suspect that along the way, when things are as complicated as that, we will have to take some expert advice on how to navigate some of that. And that's maybe where, you know, we, we, we will come back to, to some of your organisations to, to help us with that. Um, be, because we wouldn't want to just get mired down in 900 concluding observations and spend the next five years, you know, uh, caught, caught there and not actually achieving very much. So um, how, how do we, you know, focus in on the things that maybe we can actually push forward and, and, and get some expert advice on the things where we need to understand a bit more. So, so we're pre pretty mindful of that. So. Um, th thank you, but um, we will keep talking. I think I've got Danny coming in next and then Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, committee. Good morning, colleagues. 
I think the answers from uh, both Carol and Emma are, are quite indicative of the broad range of issues which are now you know, going to come into play in terms of the broadening of the committee's remit from equal ops to equality and human rights. And that's not to say that the equal ops committee shouldn't have been cognizant of its human rights obligations anyway. But I think what we're touching upon here is that the committee will have to be very clear in how th that's going to pragmatically uh, be taken forward, given you know, the, the extent to which you know, this is quite a significant broad area. So you know, we, we, as Bemis, would, would agree that UN concluding observations and the 900 recommendations and the multitude of issues which are raised should absolutely be used to enhance uh, and and, you know, encourage the, the committee's ability to advocate on behalf of the equalities issues which are represented around this table. But it's incredibly important that when we're discussing issues around about UN concluding observations for the communities that we work with uh, directly, technical papers around about UN concluding observations or, or any raft of treaties don't necessarily penetrate into the grassroots community organisations. So what we have, and particularly from a race equality perspective, is domestically led, grassroots led uh, policy and strategy papers, which are live documents at the moment. Um, one of which uh, was, was launched just prior to the dissolution of the previous parliament. And I'm aware also that this committee will have inherited the work of the previous Equal Ops Committee around about race, ethnicity, and employment. So we have the race equality framework um, which has brought together, you know, 19, 20 years of practice in relation to race equality in Scotland. And that's where we can really see the recommendations around about substantive change and how we can take that forward. And it has a raft of recommendations, not just that race equality is the premise of the Equal Opportunities Committee or BEMIS or SEMVO or CREI or any of the groups we work with, but as the responsibility of all of the public sector agencies in Scotland. Uh, and again, we have domestic legislation via the public sector equality duties and so on and so forth, which should uh, give gravitas to that argument, which at the moment, as has been identified by EHRC and others, isn't necessarily as robust as it could possibly be. So the link, I think, in direct answer to the question you gave about how do we link up uh, the domestic agenda and the international treaties, is to you know, look at the, the intermediary bodies represented and the communities represented here because it is a wealth of grassroots um, suggestions, practical suggestions about how we take things through and that should be the root of driving things forward and it should be enhanced by the recommendations of international treaties and so on and so forth. But I would contend that, that, that that's our initial standpoint because the, the evidence in the work exists yeah. at the yeah. moment. Yeah, Danny, I absolutely agree with you. Yesterday morning and, and here, um, I was part of the team that launched the Joseph Rowntree Foundation Ethnicity and Poverty Report. And a big chunk of that was about employment and access to employment, underemployment. Um, we had Abdul Bastani, who I know many of you will know very well. It was nice to see him. I hadn't seen him for many years, um, who is now uh, you know, a qualified to get a degree in accountancy, but can't get a full-time job. Um, and why is that? You know, he got all A's, he got a distinction in his degree, you know, so what, why is that? And that's, that's, that's the barrier that we face there. And that was identified very clearly yesterday. That report and the, the chief executive and a few others have now met with the Scottish Government on some of the findings from that. And you're absolutely right. It's these things that inform how, how, how we do about what we need to do, um, especially uh, in order to get it right, because if we don't get it right, then it affects people's lives, and that's, that's what matters here. So uh, very mindful of, of, of your contribution as well. Thank you. Tim. Um, the Equality Network is very much in favour of the committee extending its remit to cover human rights as well as equality. But we would think of those two things as not the same, but as, as overlapping sets, if you like. Uh, and unfortunately, that means, I think, that the committee's workload is inevitably going to be substantially increase as a result of expanding the remit. Uh, to pick up on something that Emma alluded to, the international human rights treaty obligations don't cover all of the equality strands, and LGBTI equality, uh, certainly lesbian, gay, and bisexual equality, has been a very difficult one at UN level because of some countries being very much opposed to any action on it. Uh, so that's why it's very important that you keep your focus on the equality strands as well as human rights and somehow see how you can make those two things uh, work together. Uh, I agree with Danny that there's a wealth of information already available and expertise. I'm very grateful that you've called us all here together. If I had to mention one thing which I think would help 
progress on equalities across Scotland for the whole of the public sector, it would be to do better engagement with communities and for public bodies to engage with equalities communities on our own terms in places that are accessible for people to get to at times when it's accessible for people to get there and actually to go out and ask people what are your priorities uh, rather than give us an answer to question X. So engagement is, is vital. Thank you. Janice. Quite a good point for, for me to come in. I, th I think we would agree. Um, we, we're a bit late to the table in terms of human rights. We, we've, we've taken a while to process equalities. It takes longer for things in the deaf sector to be worked through because the communications are a barrier. Uh, I think what I would also like to see when we're doing engagement and taking things forward is that inclusive communications cross cut and not just in disability world. We've argued for a, a cross-cutting theme in the Disability Action Plan, but I would argue that it needs to be a cross-cutting theme in, in everything that we do, because we're often um, not included in things. We're not in the room. If we are in the room, we can't hear what's going on, and it takes us a wee while to catch up, and then we ask a question, and everybody else has moved on. So, so I would think the way that we engage is also going to be pretty critical if we're going to be trying to take things through in a more reasonable and a fair way in, in the future. Yeah, that's a fair, fair, fair comment. Um, Derek. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, uh, Age Scotland uh, actually didn't co-sign the letter that Emma referred to, but uh, had some of the same concerns uh, about the, the remit question. And I think we would give a cautious welcome uh, to the proposed expansion of the remit. I mean, there's certainly positive reasons to do it. Firstly, because of the opportunity of showing the linkage between, uh, as Carol referred to, a sort of human rights culture, uh, embedding the idea that um, uh, human rights aren't just legally enforceable instruments, but they're to try and affect the mindset and behaviour of people who are acting uh, in a public capacity. Also, for very practical reasons, we know that human rights are going to be a key feature of the next parliamentary term. Uh, you know, there would have to be a lead committee dealing with a legislative consent motion on a UK human rights bill anyway. So it makes some sort of sense setting that out in advance. Where we do have concerns, obviously, is the capacity issue that's been uh, raised. It's probably still wise to note that human rights issues are probably still going to rise before other committees as well. So the Health and Support Committee, for example, will be looking at the way that health and social care integration happens. And obviously, rights in care is going to be a key theme. And it probably makes sense for that committee to look at that issue in depth uh, as we deal with implementation, understanding how self-directed support is being implemented and so on. So it wouldn't necessarily be the case that this committee becomes the sole repository of human human rights discussions, even if it develops a better focus and you know, a greater level of expertise, which would all be very welcome. Could I also, I mean, it makes sense that I should never speak after Tim Hopkins because he says many of the things I would wish to say. Um, but is, uh, I, I'm not myself familiar with the, ni the 900 concluding observations that the UN have made. I uh, apologise for that. Uh, I am, if I had to hazard a guess, I would suggest that they probably don't focus to a great degree on ageing because actually ageing is another area like LGBTI which isn't really covered to an enormous degree in international human rights instruments, particularly at UN level. But it is one of the protected uh, characteristics. It is part of the equality framework that we deal with domestically. Uh, one of the reasons why we had some concerns that Emma's articulated is because there was a hope, I think, among some equality organisations that um, protected characteristics, particularly those which struggle to get as much attention, might have the ability to have a bit of devoted attention through the the next parliamentary term and the work of this committee. So if there, if, as long as there are opportunities to continue to do that and the committee is willing to think about its capacity and trying to accommodate the extra responsibilities with the existing ones, then we would welcome it in that context. Yeah, no, I thank you for that. And we're, we're, we are looking at different and innovative ways that we can, we can do, you know, maybe less long, big, deep inquiries and more short, sharp, you know, lots of letter writing, lots of um, different ways that maybe we can gather the evidence that we need so that we can produce something quite quickly as well and be much more responsive um, rather than some of the things I said this morning about, you know, a long inquiry. By the time you're publishing the report, it's, it's the, the impetus is gone and the opportunity is gone as well. So we're, we're looking at all of that and including it looking at, you know, how the, the, the committee is uh, uh, supported uh, via the Parliament as well, um, because all of the committees of this Parliament have all got additional powers. So there's a bit of a conversation now going on, probably amongst all of the committee conveners, about the support that committees will need in order to, to, to just cope with the, the additional um, issues that are coming forward, whether it's, you know, social security or tax or 
um, human rights or you know some of the other things that that we're all had an expanded remit on and of course uh, the big elephant in the room is Brexit and how that will have an impact on um, the, some of the rights and the responsibilities and the freedoms that we currently enjoy and maybe how they'll be impacted as well. So, yeah, there's a lot on the agenda, but we're looking at innovative ways to, in order to address all of that. And if you've got any ideas on how to do that, please share. Suki. Good morning. I just wanted to add uh, the Scottish Youth Parliament is very supportive of the added remit of human rights under the committee's uh, sort of... Um, those responsibilities, but the committee needs to ensure, like Janice and Tim said, that engagement engagement is at the top of its agenda. Uh, the appropriate groups that are affected by all the changes need to be engaged with. Um, for example, Brexit, like you just mentioned, the European and External Affairs Committee, their initial report on the referendum, young people and children were not mentioned in it at all, despite the fact that the younger generation will be the ones that are feeling the long-term changes the most. And as well as that, the, um, the rights impacts assessments as well, there needs to be a lot of work done on that. Yeah. Um, a lot, and, and a lot of the times, um, for example, the transport committee, they re recently passed a piece of legislation um, that would affect sort of pricing of transport. There was no rights impact assessment done on that because it felt that it would not affect young people despite the fact that young people take transport like everyone else. So I think the, com the committee needs to make sure that all the appropriate people are involved in the conversations that affect them. See, I've, I, I've, I've got, um, probably the motivation now to make sure that everything that happens in this place is filtered through a rights <laughs> agenda and I have got a real hobby horse about quality impact assessments and how well they are done. Um, so um, that's a conversation that I've been having for a while and, and certainly very, very mindful of what that means because if that doesn't get done right at that early stage then you know it doesn't work for anybody but we're, we're very mindful of that and really grateful for the, the work that the Scottish Youth Parliament has done and we've got some ideas on how to engage you in some of the work we're taking forward so we'll come back to you on that very pleased david did you want to come in here all no. oh, right okay was it ian no i thought somebody had gave me a wee wave sorry sorry tim <laughs> before but uh, i just wanted to pick up on the point about eqias i mean for us one of the big big problems with eqias is that sometimes people seem to think that you need hard data to base your eqia on but there isn't hard if you like, representative data available for all of the equality constituencies. Some of the equality constituencies are quite small, and you're never going to get that kind of data through things like, for example, the Scottish Health Survey. So it's really important to recognise the value of qualitative information. And that's information you can get through engaging with communities on the ground. Information that they get, for example, through doing surveys. And surveys are self-selecting, so they're never going to be as hard as you get, for example, from the census. Nevertheless, you can get really, really important information about what's happening to equality communities through that softer, more qualitative way of engaging and a way of finding out things on the ground. I think that's really important. In relation to that, I do just, if you'll forgive me, make one more point about the census. Uh, at the moment, the two equality strands out of the protected characteristics that don't feature in the census at all are sexual orientation and gender identity. And we've been calling actually for 10 years for sexual orientation to be added as a question into the census. And it, it's, uh, it's something that will be coming up over the next five years. So that I hope it's something that the committee will keep an eye on over the next three or four years as that decision is made about the questions that should be in the census in 2021. Yeah, there's a whole host of equalities issues around about the LGBTI community. I think that we've got a number of members in the committee have, have interests in, and, and we've been pushing forward some of those agendas, absolutely. Um, Matt, do you want to come in and tell us a wee bit about the work you do with employing some of the maybe, because uh, you, you've got some yeah. ways of resolving some of the, the challenges yeah. that we, we, we all, all face. And Jamie, I wonder if you could come in in the back of Matt and just uh, reinforce, you know, where you're campaign has gone and, and some of the achievements that it's made as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, I suppose it's more the practicalities of all this, I suppose, and, and what it means uh, to people, uh, particularly disabled people that are employed support to uh, find employment. Um, if we currently look at Scotland right now, I haven't got the exact figures. I apologise for that. I'm sure we can find them, but around well, there's a huge disability gap in terms of the people with disabilities who are employed and those without a disability employed as well. It's 40% for disabled people, 80% for non-disabled people, around about that. If you break that down even further to those with learning difficulties or learning, dis sorry, learning disabilities, it's under 10%. And obviously, we 
we know that's not good enough. All of us know that's not good enough. And we need to raise, uh, we need to change that gap. We need to restrict and narrow that gap uh, going forward. Um, and to do that, um, we need services that support disabled people into employment, into fair work, but also we need to change the mindset of employers around the uh, issues to take on a disabled person. It's not an issue. It's actually supporting the disabled to do work, that it increases productivity, it reduces absence and leave in their businesses. And to a business person or a private company or any type of company, that's only a good thing. Uh, and we need to start using those messages about the power of various different groups, particularly disabled people, to employers about how we reduce that gap going forward. But also, we need to support uh, disabled people that might be at risk of losing their job. I think yesterday I heard um, some Scottish Government figures around 30,000, 40,000 people lose their job because of a health condition or disability each year. And that might be due to do with age, it might be to do with a health condition on setting that can happen to any of us at any given time for whatever reason. Um, and how we support people in that respect, maintain their job, retain their job and progress their job. I think one of the key practicalities or key issues for this committee moving forward is to give it some focus around disability. And I think that disability gap is the key area. And if you can put something on your work programme going forward about how we reduce that, I think that would really support disabled people going forward. I think there's a wee bit around modern apprenticeships. We know the struggles with modern apprenticeships in Scotland, that it has a very low rate of people that take up a modern apprenticeship with a disability. That is something as Remploy we're committed to look at through uh, the certificate of work readiness that provides a certificate for people with disabilities to move on to a modern apprenticeship that we provide currently. Uh, we'd like to see things like that expanded. We'd also like to support more thinking around how we move uh, dis young disabled people into modern apprenticeships in Scotland as well. Uh, and I think that fits with the uh, raising the attainment bar as well in Scotland. That's a big, big thing that we're, we're hearing coming out of government right now. And essentially, what is the point of all this, I suppose, for employ or, or, or others around the table, is we spend 70% of our time at work it's a reflection of our communities, it's a reflection of ourselves, it's a reflection of us right now. So we want those, we want obviously a broad range of people working in diff with different employers, but we also want them working in fair employment. And I think that's a key too, is how we encourage uh, organisations and government to support a fair work agenda going forward for disabled people. Scottish Government's currently doing some work on their, their Fairer Scotland programme, um, which uh, you know, is something that's come across my radar in the past few days, maybe something that we should be focusing in on as well in, in our work. Jamie Zimkoviak, do you want to come in now? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Following on from what Matt said and um, some of the points that Janice mentioned earlier, um, one in five doesn't necessarily have a view on how the um, committee um, organises itself, but accessibility is the most important thing um, for the disabled community so that we can feel part of what's going forward in what will be a really significant um, change over the next few years uh, in terms of um, equal opportunities and human rights. And I think that's not just regarding um, the output that the committee puts to people to access, um, whether that's in BSL format, in Braille, and particularly in easy read for people with learning disabilities, uh, but also the accessibility of the committee not restricting itself to Edinburgh, trying to reach out to communities because uh, transport and travel is a particular difficulty. So if the committee would be able to um, hold some of their meetings in accessible venues in other parts of the country, that would certainly encourage disabled people to become part and um, sort of understand more of what the committee is going to be doing going forward. Yeah, we're, we're very, very, very aware of that. And just on time and the right at the right point, Jeremy. Just um, go back to the, the questions that Matthew made, the points you made. I mean, I, I just a couple of questions about Matt, if I could. I mean, firstly, are there certain disabilities that have more difficulty getting into employment than others? Or are there hidden disabilities which perhaps we as a committee are not aware of. Uh, and secondly, are things getting better in Scotland in regard to employment for disability or worse? Or are there any figures on that? You know, is there any kind of 
findings have I met? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I take the questions. Uh, I, I'll take the, the last one first. I, I think it's removed, it's kind of re remained unchanged. It kind of flips and floats around that 40 odd percent, and it has done for a number of years. I think we've seen a recent improvement. Um, I can't really give you a reason why for that because I don't think there is one. Uh, I just think maybe there's just been more sustained effort within the sector or the employability sector to, to change that and more focus on disability in recent months and years. Um, in terms of the, uh, of the types of disability, I, I think I said right from the off, people learning disabilities really struggle to find work and it's under 10% of people with learning disabilities right now work in Scotland, which is, it's poor, isn't it? And we, we wanna, we, we as a community as, and we as Remploy want, want to improve that. And I'm sure people across the committee want to do that as well and, and Scottish government too. And we, we very much supportive of this committee and the work it can do around that. Uh, and it does need that focus. Likewise, people with learning difficulties, again, it's very low in terms of that uh, number of people that are employed. So I think there is some concentrated work we can do there. Um, but again, 40% out of 80% is still low with people with a broad range of various diff different disabilities from mental health to other hidden disabilities as well. So I think when you translate a lot what, what was said earlier down to the to level where we want to go. We want to change those types of figures. We want to move more disabled people into work. We want to have a broad range of people working in the workplace. I think that shows your communities, our Scottish communities quite well. It shows the, 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 the vast array of people that can work and, and it creates more keys of communities. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Okay. Ian. A couple of things just to, to come in on from, from the law society's perspective. Um, the first thing is that with the expanded remit of the, the committee, um, I suppose, and this may be a personal view, that my concern is that there's a, a bit of a, a possibility that human rights becomes the overriding agenda. And there's already a lot of jurisprudence out there about human rights. It's, it's a much more understood area of law and, and its regulation than equal opportunities is. And I, and I would want to make sure the committee didn't because that not, human rights underpins everything, and it's already been said that all the committees will have that as their remit, but the, the kind of jurisprudence on equality issues is not as strong as the human rights one, so I think the committee has to make sure that, that the equality issues remain a focus. And picking up a point on what um, Matthew was saying there, one of the things that we're very concerned about, for example, is tribunal fees uh, in employment tribunal cases, because since fees came in, there are the, the number of discrimination cases has nosedived. And and part of the reason for that is because most discrimination cases are brought by people who are still in work. So they're not on benefits, so they don't get remission from the fees, so they have to pay the fees. They're very often people who are at the low end of the pay scale. So £1,200 is a huge amount of money for them. So employers know that there's a very strong likelihood that those people will not actually pursue their claims. And that's why people who are disabled, people who have, who have any of the protected characteristics, are at a disadvantage in the workplace. And that's the kind of thing which is, is being missed. And potentially, the human rights issue might overshadow that. And I think it's very important for the committee not to let that happen. That would be my view. Yeah, I've spoken on many occasions about tribunal fees. And we, I think we have managed to secure commitment for the Scottish Government. At the minute they've got control over that, they're going to drop tribunal fees. And I'm sure there's many faces and heads around this room that are not going to let them drop it. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're on it. <laughs> basically. Uh, Carol, I could see you uh, uh, interacting a wee bit there and I thought maybe you'd want to come back. Uh, I, mean, I think this is just a fascinating uh, discussion that we're having and it, it's great to hear that so many folk are involved in, in human rights um, around the table and I think it would just be great if that was reflected more in the ordinary delivery of public services in, in Scotland. Um, just to come back to the point, though, that the Law Society has just made, um, the right to an effective remedy is a fundamental human right included in the European Convention on Human Rights. So I think we, we shouldn't really be trying to distinguish between what's an equality issue and what's a human rights issue. Human rights underpins the rights that we all want to enjoy. It defines the values and the practice of our society. So um, just to sort of make that point. Um, secondly, in respect of the concluding observations, um, the complex devolution settlement 
uh, for the UK is one that is really quite challenging for the United Nations and has been raised a number of times in the concluding observations and most recently in August when uh, the committee uh, produced its concluding observations on UK compliance with the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination said um, that notwithstanding the devolution settlement, it was the UK government that's a signatory to the UN Convention and therefore its recommendations were targeted at the UK government and then it would be up to the devolved administrations to deliver them as they saw fit. So I think that's important to remember and to interpret the concluding observations in that spirit. Um, the third thing that I wanted to just come back on about the employment I think there's a real danger that we start compartmentalising issues. And for me, you know, just like the right to an effective remedy, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights should be the overarching framework for how the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament expects private sector and public sector uh, companies to do business. And that would therefore tackle the disability issues, the discrimination issues, communication, accessibility and empowerment issues. Um, and I also was responding, I think, to your, your re request for some guidance on, on how to take matters forward. And I've got two specific recommendations that are actually in the Jimmy Reid Foundation's uh, paper um, on human rights. Um, the first is that um, given that the Scottish Parliament has had to make statements on all bills when they've been produced about the human rights implications, there are therefore lots of statements about human rights and how we the impact on bills and legislation and practice and services in Scotland, and they should all be hoovered up into one database, which MSPs and clerks and staff across all committees can refer to. Um, the one caveat I would say is that these statements are perhaps not as fulsome as what they should be. And it has been a sore issue in the past that particularly civil society have not had access to the legal opinions on what human rights implications there are to bills on the basis that free, under freedom of information rules um, it would harm internal conduct of business and also that it's legal advice which is not included under freedom of information. But notwithstanding that, I, I still think that could be a very useful database. Um, and secondly, in our, uh, our paper we refer to uh, the Charter of Rights in the State of Victoria. And the whole point of that Charter of Rights um, taken forward by a devolved parliament was to focus on the public sector delivery of human rights. It was um, understood to be wanting somewhat. And um, eight years later, um, there has been a review and 52 recommendations made on how the charter could be more effective. And I think quite a number of those recommendations resonate with the situation in Scotland too, although we don't necessarily have the same sort of charter of rights, we've still got the Human Rights Act, and we still have high level political commitments to international human rights treaties. So I would commend them to you. Yep, th thank you very much. Carol, Danny. Thank you very much. Uh, it was just to, sorry, excuse me, I think I've inherited the squeaky <laughs> chair today. I'll take this opportunity to get myself comfortable. <laughs> it was just uh, to, to expand slightly on uh, Jeremy's question from a, from a race equality perspective. I was at the JRF event yesterday and, and, and the, I met Jeremy just prior to it. And the direct question he asked is if, you can have one single priority from a race equality perspective for the common parliamentary session, what would it be? And I, I mean, instantaneously touched upon the issue around about employment, because uh, we know quite clearly that there's issues around under-representation across the board in various employment strands to ethnic, ethnic and cultural minority communities. So I would urge the, this committee to be bold uh, in its thought process in terms of its advocacy and in terms of what it's identifying as some of the key areas of, as, it, as, as it's going to look into. Now, we could tell you at the moment quite clearly the evidence is there that there's issues around adult discrimination and under-representation, so let's not go through that process again, uh, particularly for the communities which we're working with, just to rhyme off what they've been involved in in the last six to 12 months. Fairer Scotland, Race Equality Framework, Joseph Roundtree Foundation, Race, Ethnicity and Employment Review. And the same issues are coming up again and again and again and again. So there will eventually be a frustration and a fatigue if we don't see some progress in that. And organisations like BMIS and other race equality intermediaries will be working with the Scottish Government and other partners around about the race equality framework. But that's a significant document. What we would hope um, that the, this 
committee structure would have the ability to do is think outside the box in that regard. And Carol touched upon earlier the issue about procurement. And procurement came up yesterday also uh, at the JRF meeting. And, you know, we, we've been talking about procurement in a race equality context from a BEMIS perspective uh, for a while now. And people, you know, so what's procurement got to do with race equality? In terms of representative employment and in terms of the current economic situation Scotland finds itself in, it's everything to do with race equality and it's everything to do with disability equality and so on and so forth. Now, we see at the moment, particularly in the public sector, 32 local authorities, there's under-representation in staffing structures across the board of ethnic and cultural minority communities, but we're about to move into a period of further um, local authority recruitment freeze. So we're not necessarily going to see a major uh, increase in representation there in the coming period. Where is our money getting spent? Our money is getting spent, the public expenditure is getting spent in procurement, national infrastructure, local infrastructure, and we would say that that has to be looked at um, Tim has touched upon the issue about equality and EHRC have touched on equality as a product. So we do an EQIA and we get an outcome and you know that's fine when quite clearly that's not fitting the bill, that there's an issue here about equality as a process and it's something which has to continually build and develop and it's issues like procurement where we're spending money where that process has to start now, you know, not a kind of arbitrary social uh, context pledge uh, which we don't actually necessarily see any outcomes from, but the use of positive action measures, you know, around about apprenticeships, around about representation, around about the nature of the workforce and where the contracts are being given to. And, you know, some of that is around about how the technicalities of the procurement process works, but it's also about the systematic way in which procurement works, which works via the procurement hubs mechanism, which doesn't necessarily only have a potential disadvantage for people from ethnic and cultural minorities who are locked out of the process, but if we're talking about, you know, the buzzwords around about equitable, sustainable, representative economic development, that in some of our rural communities, they're locked out of the procurement hub process because if a roof needs fixed in Aberdeenshire, and it comes into the center, central procurement hub in the local community there, aren't involved in actually fixing that particular aspect of it. So there's actual systematic issues around about that model, which we have to review, uh, and we also have to give it a much more stringent focus from an equalities perspective. And I would hope that this uh, committee, with its extended remit, particularly being cognizant of economic, social and cultural rights, would look at it stringently and, and, and do it for, for the enhancement of, of the key issues which are being identified. Yeah, one of the, the innovations we're going to do is not to have big lengthy inquiries when lots of organisations have already done that work and we can just learn from the work that they've produced already. Uh, and that was part of some of the work we did with Joseph Browntree yesterday. Absolutely. Um, I've got Emma and then I've got two members that want to come in. Thanks very much, convener. Um, just, just to pick up on Carol's point about um, international obligations and the question of the UK as a unitary state, I think um, as Engenders tried to read some of the mood music coming from various UN committees, which, as members will know, operate quite independently, there, there are different approaches being taken by different committees. And so CEDAW, um, in our in our estimation, was trying to reach beyond the idea of the UK as a unitary state into um, the question of what Scotland should be doing on various things, including the modern apprenticeship um, programme, which others have mentioned as a key issue of concern. Um, the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was taking almost the opposite point, um, I think in a bit of frustration because Northern Ireland didn't participate in that process. And they were concerned that if you know, Northern Irish civil servants and ministers did not appear, that that didn't mean they shouldn't therefore take action. So there is a lot going on within the UN system. Um, and I, I suppose I would offer engenders um, support to committee members who want to uh, tap into our knowledge in trying to unpick some of that because it can be quite a, a daunting process practically to try and get underneath. Um, but I do see real opportunities for this committee in making some bold choices that um, equivalent structures in Westminster perhaps have not, where there's been a bit of a disappointing silence in response to some of the sets of concluding observations that have come forward, but also other um, regional instruments. And Carol mentioned um, the experience in Victoria. I think something we've discussed a lot at the cross-party group on violence against women has been the Istanbul Convention, which is a Council of Europe instrument um, on violence against women. Uh, and the CEDAW committee were of the the view that Scotland could commit to implement this um, while not being able to ratify it as not being a, a state um, in and of itself. 
uh, and that this would have real impact in terms of the uh, delivery of responses to violence against women that would integrate extremely well with Scotland's violence against women strategy, Equally Safe, which is taking a very bold approach, linking violence against women to women's inequality and therefore placing it squarely within the purview of this committee. Um, Alistair Pringle and others at a previous session mentioned the question of sexualised and sexist bullying of girls in schools. And I think if Engender was going to pick a couple of things that we would really urge the committee to focus one of your short, uh, short sharp um, processes on, it would be that question. Uh, currently, there's no data gathered on the experience of girls' sexist and sexualised bullying. Um, we are aware from other survey data that um, sexual harassment, sexual assault and rape even are occurring within schools in the UK and would really dearly love to know what is happening in Scotland so that we can then intervene to ensure that girls do not experience education in a toxic and hostile environment. Um, other things we would really like to see the committee focus on uh, are the question of the public sector equality duty uh, and the extent to which equality impact assessment um, is functioning at all to make change. The EHRC is reviewing the duty this year and we think the committee could usefully um, echo or um, parallel that work. Um, and I think the question of modern apprenticeships has been really well rehearsed by this committee in previous iterations, uh, but we now do have the Skills Development Scotland Equality Action Plan focused specifically on modern apprenticeships, and that is looking at disability, race and gender. Uh, we are at the very early stages, I think, of taking substantive action on that most pernicious of questions of how to open up that program to um, a wider variety of Scotland's younger people. Um, and I think the committee could usefully scrutinise that plan and the extent to which that is making change happen as well. Excellent. Thank you. And of course, we've seen the report from the EIS um, that we were both at that in the summer um, on, on the issues in schools. And myself and Margaret Mitchell launched the safe, Standing Safe programme for universities last week. And there's a debate in this place later today on that very subject. So all very topical and, 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 and cross-party support uh, on how we move forward with lots of those things. I'm very keen to do that. Mary, I've got you next, and then Alex. Um, thank you. And can I thank everyone for their... Um, contributions and comments this morning. I think it's been a, a really, really um, useful session. I'm not quite sure how we're going to find the time to do all of this, but, um, but we will endeavour to do that. Um, I wonder if I might move things on slightly, and I wanted to ask a specific question of Gary. Um, and, and it's in relation to the, the, the policy work that you do within the, the, the Scottish Refugee Council. I wonder if you could give us a, a bit of an update on almost the changing landscape of the nature of the work that you do. Um, and I'm thinking specifically in relation to all the human rights stuff, but obviously you've got Brexit on, on the horizon as well. So I wonder if you could give us um, just an update on what you think our priority should be in relation to the work that you do. Yeah, well, thanks for that uh, question. Uh, these were the things I was starting to think about because I, I, I don't really want to make any further comments on, I think, the focus, uh, the broad focus of the mm. committee, because I think all these comments have been very, very helpful in terms of framing the work. Um, so I suppose one of the things in preparation for this was thinking of the, the coming five years and, as has been mentioned, Brexit, um, the Human Rights Act. I mean, Brexit should not affect our international obligations to refugees under the uh, Refugee uh, Convention. Uh, but obviously it has influenced, I think, uh, UK attitudes towards migrants and uh, refugees, which is obviously a key concern uh, to us. Uh, I suppose looking forward uh, positively, we've seen refugees arrive in Scotland in all areas of Scotland, which is to be really welcomed in relation to local authorities stepping forward. <coughs> and we'd hope that would continue. Um, however, all of these areas are areas that have not received refugees before. Um, and whilst I think the initial welcome uh, has been good, we do need to really consider the long-term integration of people arriving across Scotland in, in all of our uh, communities. So uh, I suppose a concern to us is has been awareness of refugee rights in Scotland. Um, what are their rights in relation to devolved competencies and what are their rights in relation to reserve competencies? And 
a large part of our work for many years has been trying to resolve some of this confusion. Um, so we have stated to the Scottish Government they should maybe be bold um, and go back to Emma's point about looking at international obligations under CEDAW, looking at the international obligations under the Refugee Convention, and whilst they cannot ratify that, they can look at trying to seeking to embed what those are in, in Scotland uh, and look at developing national standards because this, I suppose, is a bit of a concern to us is wherever you arrive in Scotland, then you should be um, you know, entitled to you know, a fair entitlement to public services. And this will be of particular concern to refugees who are uh, arriving without status. So, for example, separated children, we've heard of lots in the news. Uh, Yes, we, we want local authorities to come forward uh, to, to welcome separated children, but we need to ensure that there's the services there to meet their needs, uh, for example, legal representation, uh, guardianship, etc., so that their, their rights in the longer term can be sure, uh, ensured. So I think these are um, the kind of broad picture, um, but this question of what's reserved and devolved is going to come up even even more in relation to the Immigration Act. Uh, and a big concern is around local authorities' ability to conduct human rights assessments uh, for those who uh, have no recourse to public funds. What is their responsibilities compared to um, the uh, reserved, reserved powers? Uh, and the Immigration uh, Act is going to remove support from families who've been seeking asylum, and this is going to cause more confusion to local authorities about what should they do in relation to those, uh, those families. So we already witnessed destitution, uh, and I think we're going to witness that even more. So, um, so I think a specific piece of work around um, local authorities' understanding of the rights of those um, who have no recourse to public funds, uh, I think would be would be very uh, welcome. Mary, do you want to come back? No, no, that's fine. That's a, a very thorough explanation. Thank you. Uh, Alex. Thank you, Convener. I've been reflecting about the uh, fundamental disconnect political rhetoric and reality on the ground. Uh, we've heard that time and again in the excellent presentations we've heard from stakeholders around the table today. I think um, in particular with regard to Matt's uh, description of difficulties for people with disabilities in the employment sector, um, I reflect always or come back to this example of in 2011 a, a significant local authority set itself the target in its single outcome of agreement of um, helping 217 to 25 year olds with disabilities into employment. The following year, it reported on that outcome and it had to admit it had only succeeded in getting 11 into employment. That's the, you know a metric just to define how problematic that is. And to that end then, I want to sort of throw a question to the wider group as to whether if we accept that there are all these concluding OBS where Scotland is still failing in its obligations to human rights and equalities, um, whether incorporation, where it is legally competent for Scotland to do so, of some of these um, treaties uh, is perhaps the way forward. Jamie, do you want to come in? Yeah. But I don't know if you can answer some of that <laughs> point in your contribution as well. I'll try. I'll try. Um, <laughs> what I would suggest is that we, we consider um, how it is for minority ethnic communities um, in Scotland and anything we decide, any, um, anything that's done in, in the Parliament, how that sort of does affect the reality on the ground and how um, families and uh, people are living their everyday lives in Scotland. I don't think we've done enough learning um, and Scotland is constantly um, introducing new communities. Um, across across the uh, nationally. Um, Gary spoke about some of the, the refugee um, communities, but we've got new migrant communities as well that have now um, settled in Glasgow for the last few years. Um, there's issues um, there that don't seem to be addressed. Um, we've got unaccompanied minors as well that come um, from, from seeking asylum. And there's a whole range of issues about how we are supporting them, not just to get their immigration status or not just to, to get their housing or their, their, um, their health in order, but so how they um, being welcomed in Scotland and how they're learning about being um, a citizen of Scotland or how they are, they're socially fitting in. Because afterwards, a lot of unaccompanied minors will maybe be supported until they're 18, 19. What then happens afterwards? Are they giving keys to a flat um, and left on their own? Are they getting employment? Are they um, 
having to go through the Home Office rules and, and report every week when the Home Office tries to detain and deport them. So there's a whole lot of issues I think we, we still need to learn about. Um, a lot of the work I'm doing just now is focused on uh, radicalisation um, and how we create safe spaces for, for young people um, to discuss issues that, that they want to discuss rather than pushing these issues um, um, sort of underground and forcing young people to, to have and to go online um, to to speak openly or to speak to, to God knows who um, that is going to influence their sort of perspective. Um, there's a lot of issues as well around um, women and how um, being from a minority, minority ethnic community, that's an additional barrier in a, in a lot of the sense. Um, and we still need to, when we talk about employment, we need to look at um, jobs that are suitable and culturally uh, suitable for, for women. Um, and I don't think we've done enough of that. Um, there's also a lot of work um, we want to do in supporting families um, and understanding um, child rights and what they can expect from, from institutions that are looking after uh, their children. Um, a lot of the work that, that or any project in Roshni does, um, I ask them to focus in, in three areas. One is the institution that um, we're working with, um, the families in the community, um, and then the children and young people. Um, in terms of radicalisation, is that we need to start having conversations with, with children at a younger, a younger age. Um, we find that there's a lot of young people and children, young people, sorry, that are sitting in households watching things in the news, hearing their parents or their brothers and sisters talk about things, but there's nowhere for them to talk, and they, they sort of generate their opinions based on everyone else around them. Um, we do a lot of work in, in faith organisations, not just in mosques, but we, we do a lot of work in, in mosques. Um, I'm, we're about to launch a. Um, a guidance book um, for organisations that are looking after their children and young people. Um, and the idea of that is to introduce child protection policies and introduce how you should <laughs> legally look after a child. Um, and we also do a lot of work with what we call unregistered groups. So a family that maybe wants their child to learn the Quran, um, they'll pay their, their neighbour that speaks Arabic um, £20 to, to teach them every week. Um, if you've got 10 kids within a, a living room environment and there's no child protection guidance or policies, these, these are the, the groups that we want to sort of um, get into and encourage people to to start forming some sort of, um, it's difficult to say, start becoming registered and start um, finding institutions that will support them. Um, there's a lot I could probably <laughs> go on and talk about. Um, usually I, I focus on one subject to, to go and do, to talk some, but I'd like all organisations to consider um, additional barriers for minority ethnic communities. Um, I think when I used to be an MSYP um, for Glasgow and so welcome um, Suki that's here. Um, but also start having more conversations with children and young people and, and learn from them and also give them opportunities to come and, and, and speak in the same way we would do with, with every other um, sort of equality group. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jamie. And I think you know, you've brought an element into the discussion this morning that we hadn't touched on um, some of the, the issues around about religious freedom and responsibility and that. And I wonder, Megan, I'm very conscious of the fact that you've not managed to get your, your, your say in yet, but I thought maybe that would be a good place for, for you to start. Is that, is that Absolutely. okay? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I'm with the Scottish Secular Society and we um, advocate for equal footing for all beliefs and none, as well as addressing uh, the mandatory privileged positions that uh, religion has in uh, Scottish law. And um, our main concerns this year have been looking at the um, endemic inequality and uh, the uh, ignoring of rights of children, um, either passively or actively, in the education sector. And um, chief of that would be the mandatory appointment of church representatives on our uh, uh, local authority education committees. So what we found is a lot of people are not even aware that these mandatory appointees are there. Um, every local authority education committee must have it. three appointees appointed by the church, independent of any voting system, and um, there's really almost no regulation on it after that. Some of the appointees are for life, some of them are cycled out uh, annually, uh, biannually, and um, the important thing is that these nominees are accountable um, for, or, or they're, they're involved in every level of decision making in, in, their, uh, in, in their local authority. So at 
the time, there are 32 education committees, and these religious representatives hold the power, the balance of power, and 19 of them. Um, they circumvent the democratic elected system, and we feel that considering that the majority of the Scottish people uh, um, have reported in the last survey as having no religion, and that actually covered the majority of people under 40, which uh, implies probably many parents with children in school, that maybe it's the time that the church don't necessarily reflect the uh, interests of the people, both locally and nationally. And we would like this to be looked at and addressed. And, and well, I mean, from the society's point of view, we feel that the religious reps maybe need to move from the mandatory to, to something more um, in the system of being co-opted in. Not that they should be removed, because if, this, if, the, if the local um, constituents want religious representatives, they should be allowed to be vote them on and ask for them there. But there should be that accountability as well. Um, as well, we, um, we have been watching, uh, so we consider education and access to education a right. And this is a right that is, comes from our shared humanity and citizenship, not necessarily our membership within a particular group. And so we are very wary about uh, the political wisdom behind the arrangements whereby all taxpayers must pay into a system, the school system, but only some of the taxpayers get to enjoy that school system, which means the schools are allowed to weed out students by their baptisms, weed out um, educators by their religious affiliations. And when we're speaking education, we're speaking about, we're, we're not speaking about religion in a nutshell. We're speaking about uh, the rights to education. So we would like, what we're noticing, and, and I, I, I probably am going to reflect what many have said. I know Tim had said this earlier. Um, we're running into a lot of people who don't realize this is the case. And I think they don't realize this is the case because there's no feet on the ground. There, there aren't people there actually talking to the ones involved. They're sitting removed, and it happens. But we would like to see more um, proactive um, efforts when it comes to these mandatory religious um, um, representatives and, and policies within the education system. Another very clear area that we're going to have to uh, take a bit of time and, and, and ponder, ponder and concentrate on as well. But, but thank you for that. Suki, I think you wanted to come in on the... I don't know if you've got an answer to Alex's question. Um, in, I was in, wanting in to just bring up some of the points that Jamie made there. Um, thank you for bringing up Scottish Youth Parliament. I think it goes without saying that I'm in full support of bringing young people on, onto the table in discussions. But um, in terms of what Jamie was mentioning about learning and uh, having open spaces for and safe spaces for young people to talk about issues that affect them, I think there's a big wasted opportunity in terms of the PSHE curriculum. Uh, the, Equalities, uh, the Equal Opportunities Committee faces a sort of important responsibility in terms of working with the Education and Life Skills Committee to ensure that equalities are promoted across the board. The PSHE curriculum, um, I think about 79% of the young people that we surveyed in our Lead the Way consultation, that's about 72,000 young people that we spoke with across Scotland, they feel that the PSHE curriculum needs changing and needs to represent the sort of big issues that are affecting young people today in terms of sexual relationships, in terms of consent, in terms of mental health, in terms of all these different issues, but are, they're not in the curriculum right now. And there's just there's a, there's a big massive opportunity for the, the government to engage with young people. They have one hour a week with these young people where they can sit and they, can, they have essentially a safe space where they can talk about all the things that affect them, but it's been wasted on things like teen pregnancy, gang crime, and things that they, they are prevalent, but they're not the big issues that are affecting us right now. And I think that we need to take a step back and we need to look at the curriculum and we need to make sure that young people are involved in the facilitation of the design of the curriculum and in the delivery of the curriculum itself. So I think the, the committee needs to work with all the other committees and making sure that qualities are promoted across the board in all opportunities. Yeah, I've got an 18 year old who has lamented laboriously over the past two years about what a wasted hour a week. <laughs> say it, she is. So, um, there's a members debate here next week on mental health education, mm -hmm. and, and, and you, you might hear some things from people on, on that as well. But again, it's something that we will be very uh, interested in and men, mindful on, especially that young that young voice. We need we need to hear it. Now, we've got 
less than five minutes left, and I've got both Emma and Carol want to come back in, and I'm wondering, will it answer some, excellent, answer some of, uh, uh, Alex won't go away disappointed. So, Carol, do you want to, to go first, and then Emma? Okay, um, in, in respect of incorporation, I mean, obviously, I, I instinctively think it's a great idea, but my real concern is that we've had the Human Rights Act since 1998, and, um, you know, there's a, a contradiction as to whether or not it's just been ignored by the public sector or whether they are subtly delivering it, um, so subtle that sometimes people don't know what's happening. Um, so I think there is, you know, if you're going to invest a lot of time and energy I'm thinking really what I'm hearing around here and from my experience, it should be human rights happening in local places where it makes a difference to people's lives um, and rather than the kind of big high level um, incorporation issues. I think it would gobble up time and energy. I, I also want to just emphasise that we have a big problem with human rights perception because they don't happen in local places, because people don't understand what human rights are. Um, in Scotland, the Scottish Government commissioned an opinion poll in last year results published in November 2015, and it said that one in five Scots say human rights are for minority groups only, and two in five Scots say they have no bearing in their everyday life. Now, I think that's shocking, because the whole point of human rights is that we're treated equally, that we're supposed to have fairness um, and understanding about dignity, fairness, respect, equality. So that's lacking from our culture, and I think we have to look at practical ways to make human rights add value to people's everyday lives. Um, and also, um, earlier, you had the opportunity to meet Stuart Merchant, who's um, sitting here today. He's a blacklisted worker, completely unfairly. Um, this is a really endemic problem. We have a body of evidence already that this is an endemic problem because the UK Parliament published its report in March 2015 on blacklisting. We've talked about a procurement, public procurement today as a way to improve private sector business responsibilities in respect of human rights. Um, so it's really important, I think, that we choose issues to invest the time and energy in that will make a difference to people's lives. And blacklisting has been horrendously impacted in people's lives. Um, and we really need to use the full powers of human rights to make a difference to, to private sector behaviour, because it makes a difference to people's everyday lives. I think one thing that pricked our ears up was the Scottish version, the, the SNAPS Business and Human Rights um, a, a piece of work. I think we'll, we'll be looking for, for that from the Scottish Government as well and take, take forward some of that. Emma, you've got the final word. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I, th I think I would absolutely take Carol's points that you don't want more legislation that is not implemented appropriately and for which access to justice is beyond the reach of individuals. Having said that, the UN committees that we've been before have been emphatic that justiciability or the lack thereof is a major gap in the realisation of human rights and we have called for the incorporation of CEDAW into Scots law um, on that basis that currently there are rights for women that are not being realised and not interrogated through the current system. OK, Emma, um, was very quick there. Jamie, you've got a minute. Oh! <laughs> uh, Jeremy kindly put forward a motion regarding disability equality training, which the presiding officer is going to work towards, and I would just like to implore that all the members and this committee reinforce that um, all the MSPs attend that for equality training for disability people. We hear you. We okay. hear you. Derek, 30 very, seconds. Very <laughs> If the committee is looking for um, cross-sectional, uh, short, sharp inquiries to look at, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd suggest digital exclusion, because actually older people, people with learning disabilities, people who's, uh, for whom English is not their first language, all of them are probably disproportionately affected by the increasing drive to move public services towards being online only. We're seeing this with um, sheltered housing applications in Edinburgh, for example, online only. Um, I know it's reserved, but the universal credit system in Musselburgh is now being ruled out as a, as a full online service. Uh, and, and there will be increasing pressure among public authorities to try and restrain their costs, and they'll see online as a, as a way of doing that. There are obviously ways we can support people, but we should all consider those who find it impractical or un unfair to be able to push in that direction. Yeah, brilliant point to end on, actually. Um, can I thank you all very, very much this morning for, for your, your points. I think to get them so concise and, and, and straightforward has been very, very helpful indeed. Um, this is not just a one-off as far as our communication with you and our relationship with you. We want to build on those relationships and, and, and hear the, the ideas that you've got and how we can take forward the, the pieces of work we've got. And every member of the committee is, is open uh, to uh, influence 
experience and persuasion, um, but only in a good way. <laughs> uh, can I thank you all very much for your attendance. Uh, keep in touch with us all, and um, I will move the committee into private. So,